Hello, and welcome to Bandstand, the official podcast of the Tennessee Bandmasters Association. I'm your host, David Adelit, and I hope you'll join us on a journey through the past, present, and future of bands in Tennessee. We'll delve into the rich history of Tennessee bands, uncovering the hidden gems and legendary figures who shaped the state's band landscape. We'll survey the present, where you'll meet the movers and shakers of today, gaining insights from their expertise and experiences. And we'll gaze towards the future, exploring the exciting possibilities that await Tennessee's school bands. The next two Bandstand episodes feature a conversation with our co-host Reggie Coleman and Reese Gardner-Herring, the band director at Arlington Middle School. In this conversation, Reese and Reggie discuss their experiences with teaching middle school band, including strategies for recruiting and retaining students, the importance of empowering student leaders, and the need to cultivate a love for band and music. We cover a number of other topics as well, including the importance of band directors being part of the school community. We hope you enjoyed this episode, part one, with Reese Gardner-Herring and Reggie Coleman. Okay, Reese, can you start by giving us a little background on your career so far? I know you went to Memphis. Albert Wynn is super positive about you, so let's hear about you. Yeah, so I graduated from University of Memphis and went right into teaching middle school at Germantown Middle School. Um, I was a COVID teacher for my first two years. My first year teaching, we made it through March, and then we shut down, of course. And then I spent all of my second year teaching virtual band. So that was a very humbling experience, a very trying experience. I uh, learned a lot, <laughs> good and bad. Uh, and then I interviewed at Arlington, and I've been in Arlington teaching at Arlington Middle School for three years. So that's where I've been the last three years. So what year again is this? This is five or six, something like that? This is my fifth year. Your fifth year, okay. Yeah. Reggie, what, is this, what is this for you? This is, this is big number six for me. Yeah. I can't even imagine what it was like to be a first year teacher in COVID. The spring break in March was the spring break that we never went back. So mm -hmm. I, I got on a few calls with my eighth graders. It was really tough. Uh, even though I'd only been there a year, you know, you build those relationships uh, with those students and then you just kind of never have that closure that you really mm -hmm. need and long for. And so we got on call for a few times and I, I went and saw them in high school that next year. So it was, it was a good time then. Yeah. I think uh, I was, I was in administration during COVID and I'm, I'm the kind of person that I'm like, all right, we're going to try to fight through whatever this is, you know? And uh, sometimes I'm completely foolhardy, but uh, my, my thing to my teachers was what, what are we going to learn from this? Like, let's use this opportunity, even though it's terrible and horrible and, what are we going to learn from this as we go through it? If you, either one of you after ever, after, after teaching through COVID, what's different or what do you think you've learned through it, through the process? Um, for me, I have learned how much I rely on my students. <laughs> um, like, you know, I've got, you know, I've got family and friends, you know, all that good stuff. Right. But I didn't realize how much how, how like much they kept me stable every day and and just like filled me with joy. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't I didn't realize that uh, until after until I was just sitting at home bored and not making an impact on anything. Yeah, and uh, then getting back into person, seeing how much they were happy to be back, and uh, that was it for me. And I'm I will never take that for granted again. I tell them all the time. Uh, whether I'm mad or I'm not at, I'm mad or happy with them, I'm like, listen, I'm thankful for y'all. I'm mad right now, but I am thankful for you. You know. <laughs> and to kind of bounce off of that, I also learned a lot about how much it means for the students to have that in-person community too. Um, their friends that they've seen for the last three years every day in band class now they just see them online. And you know, we're all. It's nice to be home for a while. You can do your laundry and you know, wash the dishes during breaks, but um, you're just right. really sad when you're by yourself. I feel like, especially band people and musicians are very much social beings. And we long for that community and that engagement that we have together through music, you know, at times. And it was just, it was a tough year, but we survived. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we're better because of it. I learned a lot about online teaching too. 
Um, that was, I still use things that I used when I was teaching online band, like smart music is a huge tool that I use mm. in my band room. Yeah. So there were some positives about it. I think that's the way to approach it is what can we learn when we go through those kind of things? Okay. Let's get into a little bit of recruiting. So, uh, if we're not in middle school band recruiting season right now, we're about to be. So Reese, how do you go about this? Yeah. So I actually have my we have two elementary schools in Arlington and we have our two elementary school tours, uh, in the last week in February on a Wednesday and a Thursday. Uh, I go about it a couple of ways. I try to get into the elementary schools before they do their middle school course selections. Uh, I try to get on the front end of it, try to bring students with me. I stand strong that students are my biggest advocators for my program. Uh, I mean, I can be as, fun and nice and funny as I can be, but if the students are not receptive to that and I don't have students who are telling kids, oh yeah, you've got to be in band, band's so much fun, we do all kinds of things, um, then they're not going to pick to be in band. So we have that coming up in a few weeks and I'm very strategic with the music I select. Uh, we I usually pull out The Incredibles or a Disney medley something fun, something that, you know, they don't realize they're not going to play immediately when they get to the game band, um, but something that they'll be able to play when they're in eighth grade and they're coming with me on the elementary school tours. Um, I bring t-shirts, like old t -sh band t-shirts, because, you know, band directors are hoarders. My AirPods keep falling out of my ears. <laughs> band directors are hoarders. So I ball them up, put rubber bands on them, we throw them into the audience, and then you have all these fifth graders wearing 2008 Arlington Middle School band shirts. Uh, and they just love it and adore it. So those are some things that I do immediately head on. My favorite party trick that I do is we have a, like a three minute band recruitment video and, or maybe it's like five minutes, somewhere in there. I pull a random kid from the audience and I take them out into the hallway and I turn the clarinet around. So they're only in charge of the embouchure. And I play Mary Had a Little Lamb, da, 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 da. and um, usually it goes pretty good. Sometimes it goes, you know, it's kind of stressful sometimes. Uh, they squeak every once in a while, and we just make a game out of it. I'm like, look, if I can teach this random kid from the audience to play Mary Had a Little Lamb in five minutes, you can come into band and you can do this too. Uh, so that's kind of my big, you know, fun thing that I do with the fifth graders and everyone wants to be selected to play the clarinet that day. <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> like, like every facet of that, I, I love the t-shirt thing. So like right now yeah. I don't have a, I don't, we don't have a way. Um, we've not figured out to get like a mass group to perform for um, yet. And so now I'm going to be like, all right, how can we see as many people as possible so I can start throwing some t-shirts and yep. put some Mary High Little Lamb? Like, that is so incredible. And I usually let the students throw the t-shirts because uh, yes. they are crazy about these t-shirts. And they're usually, you know, extra larges and 2XLs. Yeah. And they yeah. are swimming. These fifth graders are swimming in their shirts, <laughs> but they could not be more thrilled for that leftover merch that you have every year. Yeah. So Mary had a little lamb. If you can, if this person can play clarinet, anyone can play clarinet, uh, which we know is not always true, but sure. they don't know that. <laughs> it's a lot no, of fun. Don't. And it gets, it gets my adrenaline going as the director too. Cause I'm like, all right, you know, this is, can I still teach clarinet in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> it is slightly stressful. Yeah. So right now we have one middle school one elementary school that's like directly attached to us where most of them like 80 percent of them come to our school and you would think 100 percent would because we would share a campus but i think a few of them go to the school down the street um and then we've got two other ones that are half us and half another one like neither one of them are full feeders to our school so that always is kind of like awkward because it's it's like, how do you, do you try to get into all three? Um, we've really just kind of prioritized the one right now. And with that so far, we've been able to get the jazz band in there uh, to play for their, they have, they also have like a literacy night in like mm, April or something like that. 
And so we get the jazz band to go and we've got QR codes posted and, you know, we're getting kids to answer questions about, you know, what instrument this is or what kind of, uh, you know, or, um, you know, they, in the elementary school, we talk about high sounds and low sounds and, and all that good stuff. So I try to tap into that elementary school general music class a little bit there and try to get them engaged. Um, but what I'm, what I'm really looking forward to now is trying to get that full group experience happening. Mm-hmm. That's, that's awesome. So I, what my question, uh, Reese, for you is when that happens in February, right? You're doing that this month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The end of this month. So what is the process for them to sign up for band? Can they do it just right then? Does it have, is it, does it have to be, what's the process for them selecting their classes look like? So the way it works is they get a course selection sheet that they um, take home to their parents and they get to pick an elective. We call it a maths class. So it's like music, art, PE, STEM. We're a big STEM school as well. I mean, they can pick two. So usually they'll do like a, you know, a PE art. It's like a three day PE, two day art class and then a STEM class or a music class. And my biggest thing is I tell them, like, you've got to sign up for band this year. If you miss your shot to sign up for band, like you're going to be a year behind. If you don't like band, you can transfer out of band the next year and go to PE and art. You're never going to have the opportunity again to play an instrument. This is your time. And I'm just a really, you know, I'm not a salesperson, but I'm like, you've got to how could you not try to play an instrument for one year it's so much fun we have a great time. we're salespeople. We, yeah i mean <laughs> and plus you've already done the, you've already done the mary had a little lamb trick so they're already like she knows what she's doing at the end of the day like how could you not come play an instrument for me you've got to try it for one year it's and you know i just try to get them in my door and once they're in there, I would say nine times out of 10, they're sold. Once you put that instrument in their hand, they're sold. And that's another thing. You've got to get them in your door before August. So I do my instrument fitting in May, the beginning of May. Uh, and mm. they, I'm like, even if you're unsure about band, you know, sign up for band and come to the instrument fitting and you can find an instrument that will work for you. And so I have usually a band director, a professional who plays their instrument. And I just sit all the instruments around the entire cafeteria every instrument that I have in obviously every instrument that we have in band and they take their little band selection sheet all the way around and they go to tuba. And I always tell them, you know, try every instrument. You're never going to get to play all 14 band instruments again in one day in your whole life. Like Mm. you're never going to get to do that again. So you better play tuba and oboe and flute. And then they have the opportunity on that sheet to rate themselves. And then the instructor rates them after they rate themselves. So they're not kind of, you know, pressured into that. Then once they've tried all the instruments out, they bring their sheets back to me. I'm at the front table. They bring their sheets back to me and I talk to them about it. I'm like, okay, now rate one through three. What's your number one thing that you want to play? What's your number two? What's your number three? And a lot of times these kids are like, they don't even know what a French horn is before they come into the cafeteria and they leave French horn players. I'm like, yeah, you're going to play French horn. And then they don't know what oboe or bassoon is. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to play the oboe and the bassoon. And then they bring me those sheets. They rate them one through three. And I give them a private instructor sheet or a private tutor sheet. We call them tutors at my school. I'm like, here, if you're serious about it, like here's a tutor sheet. Here's your, here's your info sheet. Here's where you can go to find a bunch of resources. And I have all of these packets laid out. And not to mention, I have my sixth grade band students run that event. Uh, so I bring oh, my beginning band students from that year and I'm like, these are my beginning band students who are you know, stuck with me for life, essentially. And they are going to take you here and they're like, yeah, you should play trombone. I play trombone. We have great trombones, you know, all those things. And so because that takes me back to it's really the students program. I mean, it's my program. Yeah. I run it. I try my best. But I mean, it's a reflection of their hard work and it's a reflection of them and all of their friends want to be in band now. So. That's my biggest thing. And that is a great opportunity also for you to meet the parents because the parents have to bring them uh, to yeah. the instrument fitting. And so then the parents are like taking pictures of their kids playing tuba and then saxophone and clarinet. And the parent, that's like my initial point for like parent selling is this great event that's run by the baby band students. Oh, I call my beginning band baby band. Um, 
run by the baby band students and then they're going to get to be in baby band next year and they're going to get to run this event next year and it's just it's honestly one of my favorite days of the year is just the sheer excitement of these fifth graders who are itty bitty playing these tubas and trumpets and all of the really awful sounds that are like music to my ears in the cafeteria (laughs) and it's just it's a lot of fun for them and for me and then the students get excited about you know, they remember coming to the instrument fitting and now it's their turn to recruit these fifth graders who are coming to try instruments out. So I got, okay, I have questions. <laughs> Let's hear them. First of all, before I give you a question, I am always trying to think of ways to empower and give ownership to my students. And that's something that I struggle with um, cause you know, I think about in high school where it was, it's always the section leader's job to do, to do this. And, you know, you got to get the books for your, your, your whatever, and you got to clean up and you got to help paint the field and you got to yeah. you go clean up the bathrooms after the game and, you know, things like that. And it's like, well, middle school, it's like, we do everything. And I, and I'm mm-hmm. always trying to find ways to give them ownership and the way you are able to find ownership with your sixth graders and your beginners by letting them run this event is awesome. So kudos well, to thanks. you. Um, That's one of that. the only events they run. So they take that sure. one very seriously. <laughs> right. That's all I get. They, yeah. And it's at the end of the year. So they're trained, you know, not end of the year, but you know, but yeah, end of the year. Right. So they're it's trained. The end of the year. You can trust them now and they're ready to do something like that. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. So my question to you, and I know that first of all, any, any like, Second of all, I guess, any middle school banders who listen to this right now, I really hope they're taking notes because this is, I know I am. <laughs> this, this is this is awesome. So logistically, if they're getting tested, right, in May, this would be, mm-hmm. and you're giving them tutor sheets and you're giving them instrument sheets. So they're going to leave that day. So they're leaving that day knowing what instrument they're playing in August. Well, right? they, leave like, knowing, they leave knowing their top three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And I always, I always tell them like, you're guaranteed one of your top three and the instructors yeah. that I pick, I'm always like, you know, hype up your instruments, like hype it up, especially like I need whatever I need that year. I'm losing 11 trumpets to high school. Like I need, you know, trumpets, never one that's an issue to find, but I'm like, I really desperately need you to sell clarinet. Like I need clarinets. And then the instructor's like, Oh, okay. Like, we, I need to hype up the clarinets that are coming to try the clarinets out, but they leave knowing their top three. And I always promise them one of their top three. Um, but the way I go from there that day, I bring home all 80 or 90, however many fifth grade forms I have. And I lay them across my kitchen counter and I place them Mm -hmm. and I try to, I place everyone on their top, their first choice and see kind of where my, where my numbers fall. And I'm like, well, now I have 15 saxophones. Well, uh, let me pull out the saxophone sheet. What <laughs> I need Hit the red I button. Need <laughs> yeah. I need trombones. What saxophone players maybe didn't score as high on saxophone but put it for number one, but then they scored really well and put trombone as their number two or their number three. And so then within a week, by the next Friday, we have the instrument fitting on Saturday. The next Friday I email them their instrument selection. And then In by May. the end of school In May. They know what they're playing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I am also, because I do that so early, I email them their instrument selection that next Friday, and I give my assistant principal my beginning band schedule before Mm -hmm. I leave school for the end of the school year. I'm like, here's my woodwind class, fifth period. Here's my brass class, second period. Um, And then there are occasionally some parents who email back, and they're like, well, we actually already have a clarinet, so... Instead of playing Mm -hmm. trumpet, they need to play clarinet. Mm -hmm. So usually that's no more than five to 10 students who need their schedules changed. And by August, they're already placed into their um, brass woodwind specific class. Um, There's Mm. like, I have two brass players in my woodwind class this year, just because, you know, they're in, they're on, uh, what what do we call it? An honors course and their schedule just wasn't able to be perfect, but it's, you know, 95% perfect this year. This year is the first year where I've had no no overlap in that brass class with any woodwinds. Usually I have like one or two woodwinds in the brass class and one or two brass players in the woodwind class. But that's kind of my go-to now. And I'm always open to like ways to kind of 
perfect that and ideas to make things better. But this is this is the easiest and most efficient way I've seen. And it saved me in August because August is wild. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, trying trying to do all of that in August seems impossible. And your principals love you for that too, right? Because they want to get it done yes. in May as much as they can. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, it wouldn't be an option if I waited until August. Yeah. And that's just the, the honesty behind it. So getting it done in May, even though they don't make the schedules until July. So occasionally I'll email my assistant principal and say, hey, so-and-so actually needs to go into the woodwind class. So-and-so needs to go here. Um, so that's just my most efficient way to get that done. And then when they come to me in August, we have four weeks and they're with instruments within four weeks. And we're playing within four weeks and they have their, we call it their baby band concert. They have it the last week or the last week in September, first week in October. That's great. They have their beginning band concert. Yes. Get to the good stuff. Get to the good stuff as fast as possible. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the way. I mean, you want to get them to be able to have a product that their parents can clap for yeah. as soon as possible, right? That's so important yes. to get them onboarded and to put those roots down. And Reggie, talking about that baby band concert, you're talking about student leaders. That's a student-led concert. So I don't even welcome the parents for that concert. I speak at the very end before their final right. little shindig that they play. But it's a student-led concert. So the students are leading the band through breathing exercises, through buzzing on their mouthpieces. Mm -hmm. And we take it from like point A, this is how you put your case on the floor, to their little rock this band, which is their final finale piece that they're obsessed with at their beginning band concert. And so it's, they all have their scripts. I pick 15 speakers and those 15 students lead the yeah. band. And then at the very end, I'm like, can't, I talk to the parents about like, you know, I know that you can hear a difference in how much they've learned. And a lot of parents come up to me and they're like, we had no idea. Like you have to teach them where to put their fingers on the clarinet and how to place their embouchure. And you had to teach them how to breathe, which is like the running joke in beginning band for a while is like, we didn't know how to breathe before we got the band. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. You did it. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's a student led concert too. So it's a lot of fun. And it's pretty low stress that beginning band uh, concert when you don't have to speak and the students yeah. are speaking now that the script. Yes. Is <laughs> We, so we do, we do that. We do a similar thing, right? It's in December, but I've always, you know, me, when I saw that Smyrna middle school with um, my friend, Lindsay, we always talked about, all right, when are we going to have that September, October, November, even beginning band concert? Like we wanted to do it. Like, how do we do it? And now it makes sense. Now, when we get up, when our students get in there in August, they're not split up into anything, right? They, we have to do, we do most, most of our recruiting in that first week. And so we have two sixth grade classes and they're all mixed up in whatever, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and, and our school operates on many schools. So it's possible to get them flipped into that other class, but it's difficult and so I would definitely be interested in seeing if we can get it all done in May. That'd be awesome. But I think that if you aren't able to have that happen and you have to do your bulk of your recruiting in August, like we do right now, I think you can still make something happen sooner rather than later mm -hmm. for the parents to grab onto. And that was kind of my excuse was like, well, we can't, you know, our instrument, our kids don't play till the beginning of September and how are we supposed to, you know, buy, you can make something happen by November, you know, and, and or something to give the parents to latch on something too. So I, that's, that's, I love it. Well, and we, we oftentimes, I think uh, we consider what we would enjoy seeing and not what parents will like, like to see. Parents want to see you teach them how to open the case, right? And parents want to see those this is how you buzz on the instrument. They're fascinated by those kind of, even on the high school level, we did some of that stuff uh, when I was teaching too, is that they like seeing the sort of things that we overlook, you know, like how do you buzz or breathe or whatever. So it doesn't take, a, you don't have to play some complicated, you know, work or whatever for one of those concerts to be really effective with your parents. Am I right? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out a way to integrate parents into that beginning band concert. Um, putting them in their seats that I think that would be hilarious and the kids would eat that up they'd love it um, but I haven't figured out how to get them instruments yet 
maybe just <laughs> mouthpieces. We'll figure it out because I don't think that parents immediately realize how many things that they're doing at one time until you explain it to them and you're like, yeah, they're sitting a certain way, they're holding an instrument a certain way, they assemble a certain way, their embouchures are a certain way, they're breathing a certain way, they're playing a certain way, they're counting, they're reading music. There's just the, you know, you guys know how extensive that list is that they're doing at one time. And these are, I have to remind myself, these are like 10 year olds and 11 year olds. Mm -hmm. And so their parents, you know, it's our job. I always tell the parents, you know, it's my job to also educate you. And so don't, apologize for asking me like where do I get clarinet reads from like that's my job is to tell you you know what kind of clarinets and what uh, where to get them at and you know a neck straps and off valve oil all kinds of things so I always tell them like it's I'm also a resource for you in this and you know I always talk about band parents you know we love our band parents our band moms I always say band moms run the kids and band dads run the show and so that's kind <laughs> of what I say like the band dads are helping set up the stage and tear down the equipment the band moms are helping with the kids chauffeuring 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 so that's how i also try to get parents involved as much as i can and i've got a question about something you said earlier so that that week that you tell them in may what their instrument is Mm -hmm. now when do they get that instrument so i they come to school in august okay and i have we usually, I already set up my AMRO. We, I use AMRO for my rental yeah, we instruments. Do. I have we do too. school instruments. Yeah, perfect. So I have my AMRO rental meeting usually set up for this. It's the end of the second or third week of school. So I only have them for two or three weeks without their instruments. And yeah, it's a perfect um, amount of time. It is. Yeah. Because during that time, we're working things like uh, music literacy, rhythms. Mm-hmm breathing Mm -hmm. and I'm teaching them Mm -hmm. all those things. I also do some group work with their sections because I'm like, your section is your immediate family. And these are the people that you're going to be with for at least three years, you know, ideally three years. Um, And then onward to high school even. So I'm like, if you can't get along with your flute family, then we got to figure that out because we need some family therapy Mm because these are your people. (laughs) And I, I put them in groups and I give them work. Like just, it's a worksheet. I'm a little bit of, I guess an old person in that way, but the work she has the parts of the flute and how to hold the flute and how to swab the flute and all those things. And then, and then there's like a matching multiple choice. And they come up in front of the class and they teach the class about their instrument. Um, because I think that teaching is one of the best ways for them to also learn. So I'm like, oh, yeah. they get so nervous to come up and they're like, the flute has three parts. It has the head joint and the foot joint. And then everyone else is kind of passively learning about the flute. Um, but really, you know, they're doing the hard research and things like that. And I try to do all of that before they even get their instrument. And they're, it's like Christmas when they get their instrument. Yes. And they come and they're so excited that Saturday morning. They wait in line and they get their instrument. I'm like, okay, you're a parent now. Be very nice yes. to your instrument. Like you have to treat your instrument like your child. Um, yeah, we did uh, birth you know, certificates one year. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> they got to, yeah, they got to name them and um, they... Uh, they were. We print them all. We went. We get the, got the colored paper, and we found the colored um, paper is expensive. Yeah, you know, we got an Amazon wish list, girl. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it, it is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, birth certificates. I was. Uh, so it was. Cute. It was. It was. It was extra, but it was perfect. <laughs> Anything to get them excited. <laughs> right. They're going to name their instruments anyway, so you might as well make it official. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yeah. So those are kind of, that's kind of my game plan every year. And every year, you know, something will go different, something will go wrong, mm-hmm. something will happen. And at that point, my job is just to be flexible and figure it out from there. Um, but it's pretty, I'd like to say it's pretty fail safe, at least for now, until something happens. <laughs> but my first school, I didn't have the luxury of doing any of that. Uh, Mm Because I didn't have a feeder elementary school. So I was quite literally walking down the sixth grade hallway with a trumpet during class changes, playing trumpet down the hallway, like a very obnoxious first year teacher recruiting kids that are also obnoxious and want to be in band. (laughs) And, you know, I got I got some I got like 30 kids in each of my beginning band that year. And I was like, okay, let's run with it. Here we go. And so. That year, you know, I was a baby band director, first year teaching. I brought in people that I went to college with and I did my instrument fitting during their band classes. And they were getting fitted for instruments during their band classes. And I didn't have the luxury of having woodwind brass 
or a woodwind class brass class that year. I just had this is first period beginning band class. This is second period beginning band class. Yeah. And it was just two bands, and that's what I ran with that year. So I just kind of making the most of what you have in front of you. It's all you can do. Now, Reese, I can tell that you are, you know, you have this big personality. I know your kids love you. I don't need to be in your room to be able to tell that. Um, so do you think that when, you know, you're moving through sixth, seventh, eighth grade, when it's time to go on to high school, how do you know that, or how do you think that you are cultivating a culture of kids who love making music together and love band, Mm -hmm. right? And their instrument and each other and are not doing it because they love you. I always like to say being myself and my personality gets them into my room, but it doesn't make them stay. I mean, if they're not going to, band is a lot of work. And my expectation for beginning band is very work heavy. And just like my expectation when you're in my symphonic band, it's, it's we work every day. We work, we work. Now in the hallway, I'm a lot of fun in the hallway. I'm a lot of fun before we start class. I'm a lot of fun after we start class. But when we start rehearsal, we're rehearsal. And I'm very much, you know, that stereotypical like band director, serious focus. And we, I'd have to talk to them a lot about flipping that switch. Like it's fun right now. Boom. It's Mm -hmm. off. We're serious. And so I know that they are loving band and loving it because I, I, my first thing that came to my mind was I have an early band which is um, an hour before school, I get there early. And it's it's rough, y'all. I have to be there very early. But mm-hmm. it's at 7.30 a.m. And I have like 60 middle school band kids waiting at my door. And they just want to come in and practice with their friends. That's what they want to do. Yep. They come in. And they, they want to come play their music for me. Uh, I use smart music in my band class. They pull up Super Mario Bros. And they're just practicing Super Mario Bros. at 7.30 a.m. And it's it's a lot for me at times. I have to remind myself why I'm doing this at 7.30 Worth in the morning. It. But, but you know, my beginning band students are in that early band practice. And this is like a student-led practice. Like I am just the facilitator to open the doors. They're yeah. practicing. But my sixth grade flute players are in there at the same time as my, you know, fifth chair blue band. There you go. Band One room player. school. Yes. And mm. they are just so obsessed with hearing the eighth graders play and talking to the eighth graders and becoming friends. And now it's gotten to the point where they're like, Oh, well, that's my son. This <laughs> this yeah. sixth grade flute player, she's my daughter. And they've started this and I didn't even cultivate that. I, they've started this com- family like tree in the band room where they are all coming to early band and they sit with their family and um, they just want to practice together. And during um, all West season, they come and they play their music for me. I have a line of kids at my desk and they just want feedback, feedback, feedback. And it's the same thing when they're going into high school. Um, they get that all they get that high school audition music and they're at early band practicing with their peers because they all want to be together. And so it's by the time they're in eighth grade, it's almost more of like a community for them and a family for them. And of yeah. course, you know, they still like me, at least most of them, I think. Um, and they still like me enough to let, I, I mean, I kick their butts in rehearsal. There's no questions asked. Like, like we're here to work at the end of the day because I want you to be successful. But at that level, they want to be successful too. Um, so I think that me, me and my personality, and I always say I'm pretty spicy at times, and that's why middle schoolers like me because they're pretty spicy. Um, Mm -hmm. and they just really relate to that. And then I think when they go to high school, that just carries on then. And I still, you know, I'm at band camp and I come to performances and things like that. I don't work with the high school as much as some band directors do who are, you know, an assistant at the high school. Um, but you know, my focus is at the middle school level. And so Mm -hmm. when they do call me up to the high school and I'm teaching band camp and things, it's more, of like, I get to be the fun person at that time. Like, oh, yeah. we missed you, Miss Gardner. And I'm like, oh my God, y'all are amazing. You're killing it up here. Like, I'm so proud of you. And so it's kind of, you get to see that fruition of growth and it's nice to see them at the high school level. Absolutely. Yeah. Did I answer your question? No, yeah, you did. Yeah. And I, I think- Because I'm a talker. You know, no, I love it. I love it. It's great. <laughs> and no, I think that's awesome because it's, it seems like it- happens naturally, you know, for 
uh, for you and your program. And I think that's wonderful. And I, it's just something that I've, I've been thinking about a lot recently with looking at how many students go off into the high school bands and that, that we feed. And sometimes that, you know, you just wonder, it's like, okay, am I, are we, are we, are, do they love band? Do they love music? Mm-hmm. Or do they just love being in band with us? You know, I, sometimes I wonder. Right. And so I just appreciate you you saying that. And some yeah. of them may need one yeah. one of those things more than the other, right? Some of those kids might sure. need to rely on you as people more than some of the other students, depending on what their background is like. I mean, I think so much of, again, I only taught high school. I taught middle school just a little bit, just tiny, tiny little bit. But so much of it with with the onboarding of bringing middle school kids into high school kid becoming high school students is about how they can see themselves in the next thing. You know, can I visualize, I'm in fifth grade. Can I visualize myself being in band? Well, you know, Reese, by you coming out and putting that clarinet in that kid's hand and teaching them Mary had little lamb, they can begin to project, Oh, I can do that. Right. So Mm -hmm. when your eighth graders are working on their high school audition music, and your sixth graders are right there with them, then that helps the sixth graders track towards that too, right? It, it yeah. creates that sense of like, what's my future? Where am I going? How do I fit into all this? Can you talk, mm-hmm. either one of you, talk a little bit about how we can create those tracks for kids so that they can go all the way through the program and always be able to see themselves in the next step? Something that's a big recruiting tool for me is that I, because band meets during the school day, I can advocate that, you know, my, the cheerleaders, the dancers, the football team, the basketball team, the baseball team, they're in my band room. Um, they really are. And I have a band recruiting commercial that I show the fifth graders. And I, you know, strategically picked the basketball player who also, she also plays volleyball and she's also in my symphonic band and she made all West for two years. And I picked, you know, the, the baseball player. And I have these athletes in my room because oftentimes athletes are so disciplined and they are Mm -hmm. hard workers and they're just as competitive as I am. And so I have, you know, the cheerleaders in their cheer uniforms who are sitting there playing the Incredibles at my fifth grade recruitment. And I encourage them. I'm like, yeah, wear your cheer outfit. I don't care. Sure. You want to wear your basketball jersey? I don't care. Wear whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me. Um, And so it's, they can make that decision like band during the day. I can still do basketball practice at night um, because especially that sixth grade year, I don't have any concerts that conflict with sports. Um, and then as they get a little older, you know, we just assess as we go, like, you know, can Make you, work. you can go miss half of the game here, come to the concert. You can leave as soon as your show, your ensemble's over. And so that's a big recruiting tool for me. There is, you know, I want everyone in my room, just try it. Yeah. And uh, hopefully you'll fall in love with music as much as me. I'm always like, who doesn't love music? everyone loves some kind of music. And so I feel like music is something that relates to everyone in the world. I used to try to always get my kids when I taught high school again, to consider themselves as musicians, not necessarily as band Mm -hmm. kids, but as music, Mm -hmm. you're a musician, you play the flute, you're a musician. And because there's so many stigmas that we're always fighting with band. And that's kind of my next question too. How do you, and I think you're already answering this a little bit, Reese and Reggie jump in on this too, but how do we combat common misconceptions about band that might be a barrier, whether, oh, it's too hard or it's a nerdy thing to do? How do we combat those kind of uh, roadblocks? Um, well, it is hard and it is nerdy. And <laughs> I, I'm nerdy and I'm also athletic. I work out regularly and I just think that you just have to own it. Yeah. And I tell my kids that I'm like, yeah, you're a nerd, you're a nerd, you're a nerd. And it's all okay. You're all good. You're great musicians. And maybe that's not the answer you wanted, David. No, it is because I think, (laughs) uh, I mean, we know that nerds rule the world, right? I mean, right. Exactly. Exactly. And it is hard and we work hard. And I tell them that up front. I'm like, we work hard, but you're working hard with your best friends. And they just want to be in there with their best friends when they're in sixth grade. And when they go to high school and like marching band consumes your life, but you're with your best friends. And I don't know that community of friendships almost outweighs the hard work for them. I think. Yeah, I I agree. And, you know, I, same thing, like when we're talking to sixth graders or to fifth graders, I'm like, Hey guys, band is hard. Like, how many of you in here, we have a high uh, Hispanic and 
uh, Egyptian and, you know, all kinds of beautiful diversity in, in my school. And I'm thankful for that every day. And, you know, I always I like to ask, hey, how many of you have to speak more than one language? And, you know, half of them have their hands up. And I was like, that's hard, isn't it? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, so is this. But, you know, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Uh, and, you know, a lot of them, especially those ones that are the, the kids in class who know they work hard and who know the, the people who don't like to work hard. And they're like, oh, finally, a class of people who like me, who like to work hard and I can yeah get get something out of it you know and also and like about the, the band kid stigma you know I, I've never I, that's a good question you know I think right now it's a little easier for us because you know me and Philip my uh, uh my co-director we are you know two of the youngest guys in the school you know, we get a couple, you know, we, we, we got, you know, we wear, we wear hoodies, we wear our joggers, you know what I'm saying? We got our Nikes on, you know, and fantasy football. we're, we're, <laughs> you play fantasy football. And, you know, I might have, a, I might have a belt or two. I, know. I might have a, I, was... I might, you know, I might be, I might be two time fantasy football league champion, uh, two years <laughs> running. Right, I, you? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, but like the way we portray ourselves in the hallways and in the in the comment. Now, I do lunch duty, and sometimes I got to be kind of hard in lunch duty because I'm like, hey, yeah, make sure you're doing the right thing. You know, but for the most part, I'm in the hallways. Like, you know, we're you know we're dapping we're dapping kids up, and you know we're, we're roasting them. You know, in the gym, someone might catch a step back. You know, like you know we're playing we're playing dodgeball. We're playing. You know, we we want. And they and they see our culture with our with each other, you know. They see all the sixth graders and the, you know, and, and talking in the hallways and like they're not ashamed. And um, and we just want to show them that we're not ashamed either. We're not ashamed of them. We're not ashamed of what we do. And we're gonna do it loud and in your face. Kind of spotlight on it uh, with, yeah. with, with confidence, you know. Yep. We, and yeah, I I believe in that so much. And uh, it's uh, uh it's it, you can't live in your elephant graveyard. You know, you can't be the you can't be seen by the school community as the teacher that's in the dark, shadowy, noisy place. You've got to be out walking down the hall with your trumpet in sixth grade, trying to recruit kids, yeah. Reese, or you know, when in your fantasy, it takes. yeah, your fantasy football belt. You know, whatever it is, you have to be a part of the school. You just can't be the just the band director. You know what I mean? Yes, oh, yes, I and would, we are very much like part of the say... school. I got second place in my school fantasy football league this year. I, I wouldn't know anything about that. Gym coaches. <laughs> I've got a friend. I congrats, I congrats. I got a friend who also plays fantasy football. He's he's in the, he's a drum corps guy, but he plays fantasy football with his with the folks that are on his staff. And uh, mm. the loser, they always have a penalty for last place. And one year, the loser had to take the ACT and then that's what and then, my friends did the same thing this and year. And then publish it on Facebook. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. I don't know if I would score very well on the ACT anymore. I wouldn't put my real ACT score on Facebook, yeah. let alone Me neither. My, re my most recent one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tune in next week as Reggie and I finish our conversation with Reese Gardner-Herring. Thanks for listening to Bandstand. If you have topic suggestions or need to get in touch with us, email us at tbabandstandpodcast at gmail.com. Your input is important to us. And if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss about the past, present, or future of Tennessee bands, please let us know. Again, that email is tbabandstandpodcast at gmail.com. Right now, we're broadcasting on Spotify and YouTube, so please subscribe, review, and rate. Fox Fire, please. And more importantly, share this podcast with your friends. See you next week.